In this week's video, I'll be packing my electric kiln for a bisque firing, and as we go, I'll discuss some other aspects of my craft too. But first, let's roll the kiln out into position. As many of you might know, if you've been following me on Instagram, generally speaking, I only use my electric kiln to do bisque firings in. This is a process all of my pots go through. They're placed in here, and overnight I fire them up to 1000 degrees centigrade. This procedure turns delicate bone dry clay into much harder, fired ceramic. Not only are they hardened, but the bisque ware is also quite absorbent, which is a necessary quality, as when dunked into glaze, the pots will absorb the water, and a layer of glaze will be left on the outside surface of the pot. This isn't a step that's totally necessary in some instances. For example, when I apprenticed with Lisa Hammond, Many of the pots that we sodified were raw glazed and raw fired, which means that we coated the pots in glaze when they were leather hard, and then the bisque and glaze firing is done all together. But really that's only suitable for some types of glaze and glazes. But for my glazes, it's always necessary that the pots be bisque fired first. Generally, the way I like to work is that for a couple of months, maybe two or three, I'll spend that time making pots, and that's all I'll do. Once the studio has reached full capacity, and I've run out of wear boards and shelf space, I'll then pack and fire numerous electric kiln loads, after which I begin a marathon waxing, glazing and gas firing session, which can take up to a month. Thereafter, all the fired pots are gone over, double checked, and finally I'll start to organise a big shop update on my website, which is another couple of days spent photographing everything, writing all the details, and then finally updating the website itself. Then. Once the shop goes live and all the items sell, I'll spend another week or two doing all the shipping. And only then, once the studio is empty, finally, will it be the end of that cycle and I can begin to produce pots again. This entire process repeats itself about three or four times each year. And personally, I much prefer these longer periods of making, followed by lots of quick firings, rather than making and firing and making and firing constantly. I'm sure this routine might change in the future. And I think I should probably note here if for any of you who don't happen to follow me on Instagram, that's where I post most of my updates regarding shop updates and when they'll be. And it's also where I've been blogging online every single day for almost six years now. And you can find a wealth of content there, be it photographs, videos, stories, there's a lot. I'll include a link to my Instagram down in the description below. Although I have a suspicion that most of you will already be following there anyway. Anyhow, let's get back to the video at hand. Essentially, all I'm doing when packing each layer is trying to squeeze in as many pieces as physically possible. This makes each firing more cost effective and generally I really pile up the pots as high as they'll go or place them as tightly together as they'll go. They won't fuse during the firing as the kiln isn't going hot enough. But I should note that the clay here is a stoneware and if you're using terracotta it can be a different story. The pink hue of this clay simply comes from the high levels of red iron oxide it contains. There's a real mixture of work going into this kiln load. These lidded jars, for instance, are part of a much larger installation piece that'll be shown at Make, Hauser & Worth in Somerset in May, as will be these little slotted vases, which aren't to put coins in, but rather, when arranged en masse all together, they'll create shapes where the lines connect. Although the packing of a bisque kiln is very simple, you do have to be very careful nonetheless. Bone dry pots are exceptionally fragile, and it only really takes the lightest of knocks to chip or damage them, which is why they must be placed down and positioned with the utmost care. It doesn't help either that I trim my work to be very thin, or that they often feature a multitude of fine and sharp edges, which are just asking to be chipped. Otherwise, I try not to crowd the elements too much. I always leave a bit of a gap between them and the pots. As the pots undergo quartz inversion at 573 degrees centigrade, the pots expand a little bit before shrinking further, hence leaving a gap between them and the elements. As if there's one thing I don't want to do, it's damage them. The other obvious thing is making sure that your work is all dry enough before bisque firing it. Again, I generally trim my pots to be very thin, so I never really have any issues with things exploding inside the kiln, which is what happens when you fire pots that still contain quite a lot of moisture. Contrary to belief, you can have air pockets inside pots, as long as there's absolutely no moisture in the same vessel. If you have an air pocket and a wet pot, the steam builds up in that pocket and expands, and that's what causes pots to explode. 
The red coloured props here are simply ones that have been gasified and therefore flashed with flames and coloured through the reduction atmosphere, otherwise there's no difference in them really. That being said, you should never use props that have been salt or soda fired or wood fired even in your electric kiln as the salts that are likely present on them can damage your elements as they volatilize during the firing. For the most part, I think people generally underpack their bisques. You can really squeeze in a lot more than you think. Although for some forms I am a bit more careful, such as dinner plates and larger bowls for instance. If it's a flat, wide piece, I'll make sure that it sits very flatly against the kiln shelf itself. Whereas my medium bowls, I'll happily stack up to 10 high during these firings. But that's because with those, the weight is distributed from foot ring to foot ring to foot ring. The walls of the bowls themselves don't take any of the weight, so there's almost a solid little column of foot rings in the middle of the stack of bowls, and that's what supports it. It can be a puzzle sometimes to get everything to fit in nicely, a giant three-dimensional jigsaw, and sometimes you need to try out numerous iterations before you find the most efficient pack. And as I pick up and move each piece, I'm constantly being considerate. I try not to drag the pots on the kiln shelves, as that can damage the base, marking them. For the same reason, whenever I'm gripping a pot with one hand, I make sure that I don't squeeze too hard, as it can be quite easy, simply via squeezing, to crack the piece, and sometimes it won't make itself known until the piece is glaze fired. The electric kiln I'm using at the moment is a Rhoda TES 200. So it has a 200 litre capacity compared to my gas kiln which has a 340 litre capacity. Although as the pots and the bisque firing can be stacked, I can always squeeze in way more in the electric firings as compared to my gas firings. I'm also currently beta testing Rhoda's new electric controller, which means I can see what my kiln's up to, track its temperature and select programs from my phone, which feels very futuristic. My bisque firing schedule is pretty simple though. I simply fire at 65 degrees an hour until 600 degrees centigrade. Thereafter, the temperature rises at 200 degrees an hour until it reaches 985 degrees centigrade, where it then soaks for 15 minutes, which usually gets the temperature to about 998 or 997 before it switches off and begins to cool down. And it's usually the day after the kiln's fired that I can unpack it and move on to the next step. And lastly, I kneel down just to check that none of the pots are sitting too proudly. And that's it, it can be closed up and fired overnight. The workshop itself is very well ventilated, and I'm never in the studio when the kiln's actually firing. The unit itself is built into an old industrial laundry, and there are grates leading to the open air, and plenty of leaks in my roof too. Once the kiln's ready to be powered on, I switch it on at the wall, and then select my program on the controller, and finally switch it on. In theory, I could do my bisque firings in my gas kiln, but being able to do these simple bisque firings as I sleep is a luxury really, and one that saves me a lot of time too. This is the same kiln the following morning, and as you can see it's still far too hot to open, so usually I won't actually unpack the kiln until the day after this. But once I'm finally ready to unpack, I switch the power off and then lift the lid and see what's inside. Which, as this is only a bisque firing, there's never really any surprises. Although for a brief moment, the clay does take on this wonderful pink hue. But sadly that's lost once the pots are glaze fired. The pots are then carefully unpacked and placed on these wear boards, ready to be moved over to the wheel, where I'll then begin to wax them. And although the pots are much harder, and therefore are more strong too. I still handle them with care, as it's still very easy to chip those delicate edges. There are two, of course, pots that I won't carry on the wearboard, such as those teapots on the top layer you saw me stack earlier, or anything that's more susceptible to wobbling over. I've dropped wearboards of pots like this, and trust me, it's not worth it. I actually glazed and reduction fired many of these pieces on the 19th on Friday, so hopefully I'll be able to show you some of the results very soon. Although some will have to wait for the exhibition in May, although I may very well be posting some photographs over on my Instagram too. Waxing these pots is the next step, and I'll show that once the kiln's been fully unpacked. It's a fast process, 
and really I can do an entire kiln load of work in just a few hours, if that. Really, it depends on the complexity of the form, but pieces like the coffee cups that were packed into the bottom of this kiln load of work can be done incredibly quickly. Otherwise, there's very little to add about how I unpack a bisque load of pottery. As each shelf is drawn out, I make sure that I don't bang it into the soft brickwork. The insulated bricks these kilns are made of are very fragile too, and it really only takes a very gentle knock to scratch or damage them. I was actually invited by Rhoda to go and see my kilns being built, so I flew to Vienna and then we drove to the Czech Republic to the factory. I'll quickly include a few photos here, but it was a fascinating experience. I truly had no idea how handmade each kiln was, and I certainly didn't think that each brick would be hand ground into place. It was honestly a fascinating experience. And this here is my gas kiln itself, which was quite amazing to see. Thanks again, Rhoda. I'll be doing a lot more gas firing soon, so expect to see a lot more of that kiln. And I'll also use this moment to see if you guys are actually interested in seeing more detailed gas firing videos about the reduction process, the way I do it, and so on. Let me know in the comments. Packing and unpacking the bisque kiln is actually quite a quick process, really. And as long as all your pots are ready to go, I'd say that packing and unpacking only takes about half an hour to 45 minutes or so, depending on the size of your kiln, of course, and depending on whether you've decided to film the entire process or not, which certainly adds some extra time. But really, that's all my electric kiln is used for, bisque firing, which is probably why it's in such good nick as the temperature inside never really surpasses 1000 degrees centigrade. Anyway, I'll include a few steps here from the next part of the process. The waxing, the glazing, and the packing of the kiln. The wax I use is a really simple, bog standard wax emulsion, which I'm pretty sure most pottery suppliers will sell. I take this emulsion, and I water it down just a touch with some boiling water, before giving it a good mix, which helps it brush on much more neatly. In the past I've used both beeswax and paraffin wax too, heated in a small pan or over a table light candle, both of which work wonderfully too. And as for a brush, I use one just like this, which has relatively fine bristles, which I think also helps it to brush on a bit more smoothly. The pots are then tap centred into place, and the wax is brushed on, with an extra dab placed over my maker's mark, just to make sure it's totally sealed. The key to brushing it on smoothly and your pot not moving, is to not let the brush drag whatsoever. So as soon as I feel any friction, I either get more wax or I rotate the brush to move on to an area that has more wax on it. But that's essentially all there is to it, and it's a process I think that benefits immensely from being able to tap centre, as it's this step, if done slowly, that can really add on the minutes to your workflow. I do have a much longer video all about tap centering, which I'll link to now. But essentially it's the process of tapping the pot in a specific place until it spins on its central axis, perfectly in the middle of the wheel. It's one of those skills that just requires a knack, and I won't go into detail in this video about it. But I can't recommend enough taking the time to learn how to do it. It's so incredibly useful. The next step for these mugs is glazing. Each is grasped firmly with a pair of tongs before being submerged into the glaze for about 4-5 to five seconds. How long it needs to be submerged for is entirely dependent on the type of glazes you're using and the thickness of your clay. What I'm telling you in this video is simply what works for my pots. For your own practice you might need to do something entirely different. This is the quick part really, of the glazing. It's the step that comes after that takes much longer. And that's the cleanup. So this is the same glaze but about a day or so later. And you can see just how much drier it is. All the water has evaporated from the clay body, and this leaves the glaze surface being very powdery, and therefore much easier to clean too. So I just spend a few moments wiping over any tong marks, and cleaning up some of the pinholes that appear, and any of the stray drips too. Really, the neater it looks at this stage, the neater it'll look once finally fired too. Once the walls and the inside of the form have been gone over, I then use a wet sponge to clean over the base. Although the wax has acted as a resist for most of the glaze, there's still a few droplets that have settled onto it, so I sponge those away, and then I very carefully 
sponge the line where clay and glaze meet to make it as pristine and perfect as possible. This really isn't a process that can be rushed, and it's one that takes a lot of time, especially if you consider that I'm doing this to probably four to five hundred pieces in one go. And if I ever do get an apprentice, I really hope they like cleaning up glaze. And that's it. Now this pot's ready to be packed into the gas kiln and fired, alongside all manner of other pots. Like I mentioned previously, I'm going to be doing a lot of gas firing soon, so expect to see lots more videos about this process and others like it coming soon. And I should mention, the kiln that's being packed now is my gas kiln, the same one you saw being built earlier. It's been firing wonderfully so far. I just hope everything's okay when I come to unpack it tomorrow. This little clip here was just filmed as I was lighting the kiln earlier on Friday morning. The flames kept nice and low so it can heat up gradually for a couple of hours before reduction starts. And that's all for this week. Thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you next time.